Welcome to this week's episode of Startups for the Rest of Us. I'm your host, Rob Walling. This week, I chat with Matt Wensing of Summit and of Risk Pulse, a software company, a SaaS company he ran for 15 years before selling it earlier this year. And we dig into his journey, building it to multiple seven figures, uh, finding a CEO and replacing himself in 2019, and then selling Risk Pulse in 2020 for a life-changing sum of money, then moving on to Summit, which is a tiny seed funded company. And then we also dig into forecasting because Summit is a, for actually Risk Pulse and Summit were both forecasting engines. Risk Pulse did it for logistics and Summit does it for SaaS companies and recurring revenue companies. So super interesting conversation. Matt is just sharp as a tack and you know, has a, a really deep insight into forecasting and how it works and why it works and when it does and, and all that stuff. So I, I enjoyed our conversation. I hope you do as well. Before I dig into that, I wanted to call your attention to MicroConf On Air. Go to microconfonair.com. It's a daily live stream that I've started doing. It's 30 minutes every day at noon central time. And it's an idea that we, we came up with on the MicroConf team to try to connect people together, you know, because really right now, a lot of us are essentially in our homes 23 hours a day. And a lot of us have kids at home as well. And even though if you're used to working from home, it's still such a different situation. Now you can't go to coffee shops uh, in a lot of places in the world. We can't, you know, we can't just can't do the normal things that we're used to. So started doing this live stream. I've been really enjoying it. it microconfonair.com. If you just want to watch it, if you want to be involved with it, you go to microconfconnect.com and apply to be part of our Slack group. Once you're in the Slack group, then you can ask questions. So I'm hosting Q and A's. I'm hosting a happy hour, typically on Thursday or Friday. We're doing some video rundowns where we actually watch microconf talk videos from 2019 with different founders. Um, this week, as this episode comes out, we're going to have Craig Hewitt from Castos. We are going to have Ben Orenstein from Tuple. And they're, you know, the idea is that we release their videos and you can watch them a day or two in advance. And then you can ask them questions about their talk videos or about anything about their story. So anyways, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. It's the first time we've ever embarked on something like this. And we pulled it together very, very quickly um, over the course of about, when well, it was about 24, 48 hours. The first live stream was supposed to be 30 minutes and wound up being about nine minutes before the stream crashed. But since then, things have been going really well. So I'd love to have you join us there, uh, microconfonair.com. And with that, let's dive into my conversation with Matt Wensing. Matt Wensing, thanks so much for joining me on the show again. Hey, thanks, Rob, for having me on again. Absolutely, man. So I talked in the intro about you growing Risk Pulse, finding a CEO, and selling it. And I always ask people who have had these life changing exits, what was it like when you looked at your bank balance, you hit refresh? And you see all those zeros for the first time in your life. Yeah, I think I think for me it was a huge relief just because just the sheer number of years that I put into it, it was not a hey, let's let's bet the summer on this. You know, it was it wasn't quite bet the farm. I didn't go that far. Like if it hadn't happened, things would have been okay. But, you know, I was very invested in it. And yeah, it was it was a, it was a huge relief to see that definitely. As you said, life life changing, and you know, obviously life improving, but really just that peace of mind, you know, that you don't have for sometimes a very long time <laughs> in startups. Indeed, it was a really long journey for you, right? It was. Was it fifteen years? Yeah, I had the idea in two thousand four. So I, yeah, I I went from idea in 04, drawing little notes on post-it notes at my lunch hour while on break as a software developer, thinking, hey you know, steps one through four of starting a startup. Let's do this <laughs> 15 years later. Oh, congratulations, man. Did you, um, I know all the listeners are thinking, did you buy anything? Did you buy a Porsche? Did you buy a house? <laughs> um, I, yes, I, I did. I did a couple things. We've been postponing a great ski vacation for a long time. It happened in December and guess what? <laughs> it was, uh, it was time. So I took the kids something I've been wanting to do for years was take the kids on a ski vacation. So we, we last minute booked all that, didn't worry as much as we normally would about the uh, last minute rates and went up to Whistler, Canada and had a, had a great time with family, invited family to come join us. So that was great. And then uh, I did have a, you know, I inherited a car from my parents a few years ago just because they didn't need it anymore. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, an extra commuter car is always helpful, especially when it's paid off and uh, was able to get rid of that and get a new vehicle, which felt great. <laughs> 
Very nice. You know, it's funny because when I was, um, there's a podcast called The Tropical MBA and Dan and Ian talk about entrepreneur mobiles. And it's basically that sheet piece of shit that you drive while you're trying <laughs> to build your company because you're not actually making much money. So I drove a salvage title 2006 Buick Rendezvous that at one point had a bunch of duct tape on the wig. The mirror got hit. <laughs> and I, so, I mean, I drove that up until a year after I sold Drip. I like that car, you know? Totally. And and then the next car I bought was, it's a nice car. It's a Volvo. It's the nicest car I've ever owned. In fact, it's, I still bought it used though. I could not, I couldn't bring myself to buy a new, a new car, but yeah, that's funny. I, we, we had the 2005 Toyota Sienna minivan, in which we put 215,000 miles on Boom. as a, as a family. And we, we replaced that with a, you know, a modest, you know, functional SUV. But then I had inherited a car from my parents that was uh, an 04 and it worked. It was fine. It was it was exactly like what you described. It was paid off and worked and got me from place to place. But yeah, I, I traded in and I did get an off lease vehicle because again, I didn't want to pay the depreciation. But it's it's a lot more fun to drive. Totally. <laughs> Once a scrappy founder, always a scrappy founder. That's you know, yeah. that's what I yep. found with folks. It's hard to change it. So I want to I want to ask you about a couple things. One thing that you did that was super interesting with Risk Pulse is. You build the SaaS app to multiple seven figures, and then you replaced yourself with a CEO, and you moved on to start Summit, which we'll you know we'll talk about towards the end of the interview. That it's very, I will say it's unusual. Most people don't go through that experience. Most people aren't able to find a CEO. It's not even on the radar of, of a lot of people. What was that process like, and why? Like, why did you why did you take that step? Yeah, it, it was it was a process, and I think it was the. The decide, deciding that he was going to be CEO was definitely the last step in a you know in a mental journey that started with you know we need a experienced enterprise sales executive to join the team and I had a recommendation from a board member which is a great example of how board members can be value add is uh, helping you find top talent and in this case he knew him professionally they'd worked together before and you know it was somebody that had significant experience building companies from the, you know, few million in revenue to the next phase. So kind of the 10 employees to 100 employees phase, which is a great fit for where we were. And so I, I initially hired him to be chief strategy officer, which was a fancy way of saying, not quite sure what your title is going to be, but I know that you have a lot of experience and we want to just get you involved. And the first things he did was really focus on sales and overhauling the sales process. It's an enterprise sales process. And he had more, you know, even though I had more experience in the business, of course, because I've been doing it for years. He brought in that outside experience and revamped our sales process, professionalized it. And that was kind of the word. It was really going through and professionalizing each function in the in the company. And after sales, it was marketing and customer success and FinOps and kind of all down the list. And then, you know, lastly, we just kind of kind of got to the point where, you know, it wasn't that I didn't want to manage him. It was more you know, what's in it for me? Like, why, why do I want to hold on to Because it was clear at that point that he could be CEO and that, you know, I didn't need to be. So it was kind of an either or. And, you know, without any forcing from the board, I mean, this was completely my idea. I said, you know, I'd never intended to run this company forever. <laughs> that's not my, that was not my identity. And I think that's, that was like the key decoupling that was already true in my mind and heart was like, who I am is not the CEO of Risk Pulse. It's, the founder of Risk Pulse, maybe a little bit more, but you know, the CEO to me was always a it's always a title that could be changed at some point. And I I always intended to change it at some point. So it just became a really natural transition to say, he's that person now. Announce it to the board. The board was, I mean, if anything, they were a little surprised at my willingness. Like it was almost like what you said of this doesn't usually happen and it isn't usually peaceful when it when it does happen. But yeah, I th I think that's a, you know, that that should be the goal of maybe more of us is like a peaceful transition of of leadership and and power. I mean, that's that's kind of a that's kind of a an important tenet of of you know well functioning organizations. So I, I was happy to do it, and it just immediately freed me up to focus on just the things that I was world class at and still wanting to focus on, and then ultimately wind myself out of the business. Yeah, and that's I mean, when you work on a business like that for what fifteen years in your shoes, I would have grown tired of it, you know, probably quite a bit before that. And I'm not, I'm not putting words in your mouth saying you grew tired of it, but we as founders, as entrepreneurs, like we like to build new interesting things. And it sometimes it can be hard to do that once a business is as mature as, as Risk Pulse was. 
Yeah. And I definitely, there were some elements of that, which was I was functioning well, but the reality is my superpower, if I have one, is doing new things. And, you know, once a company gets to a growth phase where it's about doing the things that are working more and more and less about creating new things that add risk and, you know, add new variables to the equation, I wasn't getting to use that superpower as much as I even wanted to. So it made a lot of sense for me to, you know, either A, find a different role in the organization. And for a while I was chief strategist. So I just kind of gave myself a new title and said, you know, that gives me a little bit of freedom to figure out what I want to do and see where I can add value to the organization. But like I said, once you get into that growth phase of let's do more of what's working, but faster, it's not the same, you know, it's not the same job. Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the really savvy benefits or one of the pros of doing it is that when you sold Risk Pulse just a month or two ago, you weren't forced to stay on and work for someone else for a year or two. You know, the earnout wasn't there because you were so uh, unaffiliated is probably not the right word, but you just weren't actively working on the business day to day. Yeah, that was, that was just kind of, I'm looking for the word, but it was really a coincidence. I guess is the only way I can think to put it that, you know, I wasn't attached. Like you said, I wasn't, um, Mission critical might be the right way to put it. I was there as an advisor and a board member and clearly had a lot of institutional knowledge. But at that point, the vision and the leadership and everything had been transferred over to the team. So I was, you know, I was just a, just a shareholder at that point, you know, obviously a huge fan. Yeah. And before we talk about your, your next act or your current, (laughs) the second act, which is summit, I just have a question or two about the exit itself, about selling risk polls. I'm going to assume I love talking about highs and lows, right? Like what was the emotional high? And I'm just going to put words in your mouth that it was when it closed. It was the it was the relief of everything being done and 15 years of hard work paying off. Is that accurate? Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. So what I want to hear now is, and I know there's so many lows in these types of, of acquisitions and stuff goes sideways most of the time during the long process that it winds up being, and a lot of stuff goes sideways at the last week, you know, always, every time people think that buying a house is stressful or selling a house is stressful. This is 10 times or a hundred times, you know, nothing is standard, right? There is no realtor document that everybody uses. It's, it's just a big argue fest is what it is, what it felt like to me. So I'm curious if you could talk us through like a point where you had your head in your hand and you were thinking this, this isn't going to happen. Yeah. I carried that thought in my head. I would actually have to say until the wires were done. I mean, you know, almost to the point of absurdity, except I was not disappointed. <laughs> and what I mean is, I always had that thought in my mind of this is so fragile, right? Like, it's always fragile until it's finished. And, and I think that's the way with with all deals, like time is the enemy of all deals. And, you know, when you're trying to align, so like, to, to, to make it more concrete, risk pulse at that point, like we said, you know, we had incorporated it in 2007, but we had raised money in 2012 and 13. And because of that, we had a number of, you know, shareholders on the cap table that was not, you know, not your typical three investors. And that was it. Like there was a a lot of stakeholders at that point. So, you know, I definitely had my role in the, in the transaction, which was, Hey Matt, you're the one that raised money from all these people you have relationships with these folks and and we need somebody to be the spokesperson. And obviously being a board member, that was my role was reaching out to all these, all these folks that had some stake or some ownership in the business and let them know here's what's going on and, and here's what's next. And, and here's why we need you to sign. And, you know, when you need to get X number of signatures to have something go through, even if everything makes perfect sense to you, right? <laughs> Just the simple act of needing to depend on the signatures of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 other people, (laughs) you know, it it just creates a lot of extrinsic risk of somebody could be sick right now. Somebody could be on vacation for three months. Somebody could be no longer in the mood to do this. Like who knows what, right? And, and, you know, I'd like to say I had a close relationship with everybody at some point, but you know, the years go by and you're not really sure where everybody's at. And so there was always this risk there in my mind of, you know, who knows what's going to happen. And, you know, I think for me, like the worst was the week the deal was supposed to be done was the worst because you're, you're landing the plane <laughs> and, and most accidents happen when the plane is either taking off or landing. Right. And so needing to see the green lights, if you will, light up one, two, three, like sequentially, just see everything go through was very nerve wracking. Right. <laughs> it was just, um, 
I, I kept telling my wife, like, something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. And, and I won't get into the details. Like, there were weeks where things did happen, <laughs> though, I will say. And, you know, thank goodness, had a great team. You know, we had reasonable acquirers and great lawyers and everything worked out. But it was not just a smooth, you know, like you said, hey, check here and sign here and everything's done. I mean, it was a, it was an orchestration, right? And you're just hoping everybody, everybody does what they're supposed to do. Yeah. When there's that many parties involved, it does get complicated. Did it make you, did you regret like raising money or raising money from so many investors because it brought that complexity on the exit? I mean, I just, frankly, yes, I didn't raise, I didn't regret raising money for sure. That many though, yes, like that's not something I'm going to do again. And a lot of it was just, you know, when you need money and you're first starting out your first company and somebody offers you, you know, a small angel investment, you take it, right? When you're looking for wins and you need to pay the bills and and all that, you take it. And so it's not like something I could go back and just decide to do differently, right? But there are ways now to improve that. And one of them obviously is you know, when you have a little more credibility, you have the luxury of maybe doing things differently. But the other part is now we have things like angel of syndicates and ways of bundling investments. There's a lot more seed investors too, who will just say, you don't need to go raise $5,000 from 10 people, right? Like I'll just write you a check for 50 grand or hundred grand. That wasn't as common in 2010, 11 and 12 as it is now. So I, I don't think I could go back and actually do it differently. But the second time around, I definitely will be doing some things differently just to decrease that risk that's just inherent in having a lot of stakeholders and and not that any of them were controlling but you know it's simply just a matter of the more servers you have running the more likely that one of them is going to is going to go down right it's kind of that thing absolutely and yeah the more like you're saying your first one you just you have to do what it takes to keep the to keep the servers on and to to pay the bills and so yeah it's an interesting thing it's I've made some decisions like that that wound up kind of coming back to bite me years later, but I never regretted them because they were the right decision at the time. I, I wished it was different, but there's there's oftentimes nothing you can do. Exactly. So then let's let's talk about your transition from Risk Pulse to the seed, the idea of Summit. And Summit's at usesummit.com if folks want to check it out. Your headline is Great Teams Forecast Early and Often upgrade your gut feeling to forward looking metrics. So risk pulse was weather prediction and logistics prediction. And obviously taking that, I think you mentioned last time you were on the show that somebody, a friend of yours jokes with you that you're kind of a one trick pony that you take prediction and you just move it from, from niche to niche. So there's a lot of analytics providers, right? We can go to, to bear metrics and profit well and chart mogul. And, you know, there's, there's a bunch of stuff, even, even Google analytics, although I, that's not, you know, doesn't have anything to do with revenue. There's Stripe dashboards. There's all this stuff. What made you come up with the idea for summit and, you know, why build another kind of analytics provider? Great question. You know, I, I was running a SaaS business with risk pulse and I had, some metrics, I would say that some of the tools you just mentioned either weren't there or, you know, we didn't adopt them early. So our metrics were hard, harder to put together than just looking at a, a profit well or Stripe or whatever dashboard. But the, the problem I set out to solve wasn't having analytics per se. It was, I'm getting asked hard questions by, you know, investors and my team about how the business works and how the business would behave if we change something about it. And so that's something where, yes, you can look at a chart and you can definitely look at a history and it tells a story, right? If you're good at interpreting the data, you can you can tell the story of why your MRR looks like it does or your ARPU or whatever. But this was more of a what if question of not what happened, but what would happen if we did this or we did that or what's going to happen if we do nothing, right? And it was, it was always about the future because I was, you know, I spent a lot of time fundraising with Risk Pulse and those questions are just really hard to answer. And when I wanted to answer them, you know, the metrics on hand were a great starting point, but they didn't give the answer that people were looking for. And, and we all know the the tale of the hockey stick and how we all, <laughs> you know, a founder left alone in a room with a, with a Google spreadsheet will, you know, exit with a hockey stick of some kind if nobody's checking and, and balancing that. But, you know, that that's not what I wanted. I wanted something that I could use. And ultimately, as a business, we did end up building a, a FinOps team and, that was really a game changer in terms of now we're managing the business through the lens of how we're performing and how we think we're going to perform over the next 12 months. And, you know, I, I said, this is, this is super valuable, but it's something that most people can't hire 
two or three headcount <laughs> to focus on on this or a CFO. So I, the, the challenge for me was how do I productize that value, which is you know really about forward looking for the sake of making decisions today that have an impact tomorrow. And that, that was really the genesis of it. And so it, it's interesting that you have, you're, you're catering both to investors and also to startups. How are you thinking about that? Yeah, startups need forecasting and we can talk about the use cases for that and why. But one of them that makes, uh, that comes up again and again is, is when investors or potential investors ask for these things. And if there's ire and some groaning about the realism or the, the likelihood of these forecasts being true that, you know, when startups make them, investors that receive these things, it's, it's easy to make fun of investors and, and a lot of people like to do that. But the reality is like good investors don't want unrealistic or silly projections either. You know, I know that everybody thinks we want that slide that has the everything up and to the right, but a good investor, especially one that's thinking about sustainable, profitable businesses, which is a kind of investor that's more common these days, really wants something that is defensible and rigorous and the big thing is consistency. Like I think for you, Rob and Einer, like if you had to look at 10 different ways of presenting metrics and 10 different ways of presenting a forecast every month, you know, it's just way more overhead. So, so for me, it's a convenience uh, service for the investor. And I think in the future, it will become something more of an analytical engine for them. But for now, it's simply the, you know, they love the consistency of it. And I, I've had um, more investors say that they'd be willing to essentially tell startups, hey, when you send me your metrics, can you send me the summit URL instead of a spreadsheet that you create today? <laughs> because, you know, it'll have everything I want and need. And, and frankly, it'll be a little bit more professional than probably what you put together in, in a crunch. Yeah. And that was a field we actually had in the Tiny Seed Batch 2 applications was, you know, it said, right, do you use Summit? Question mark. Put your URL, your kind of share URL in here. And when folks sign up for Summit, they just connect their bear metrics, ProfitWell, ChartMogul, or Stripe accounts, correct? And then that, it just pulls in all the stuff, the, the backwards looking data, and then Summit does forecasting based on that. Is that accurate? Yeah, exactly. It, it it generates a trend cast, as I like to call it, of all that data, which basically says, you're moving in this direction and this is how things are likely to keep going just based on, I almost think of it like inertia. And so that's, that's just helpful to see what direction is the business going. And, and, you know, that's the initial reality check of it is that, you know, as entrepreneurs, we can be incredibly biased towards what's happened last month. And if it's, in other words, if last month was great, we feel great and we think everything's going to just keep skyrocketing. And as last, last month was down, we also sometimes think that, you know, the sky is falling. So that piece there is really meant to do some just initial resetting or setting of expectations for everyone. And so there are a lot of folks, you know, you mentioned if you're, if you were going to raise investment, oftentimes an investor will ask for forecast. A lot of folks in the audience are not going to raise investment, right? They, they're going to bootstrap. What's the benefit there? Why should they think about looking ahead three, six, 12 months and trying to figure out where their business might be? Yeah, there definitely is also application there. I mean, one, one example is, well, I actually think of it in two ways. One is if you're in the default dead stage, <laughs> which is if everything continues like it is, essentially this business is going to run out of money, then the clear one there is there's nicer phrases for it, but let's just call it the drop dead date, right? <laughs> like what's the what's the date where, you know, this thing runs out of money? And you, you can do that with a simple calculation that just says take the bank account balance today and and withdraw a certain amount each month if your business is is that stable. It can help with that. So so cash forecasting and, and runway forecasting would be the primary use case for a default dead quote unquote startup, even if you don't plan to raise money. Uh, you're just trying to get to profitability. So the next one though is like, okay, when are we going to get to break even, right? I mean, that's what so many bootstrappers are obviously striving for is like, when am I finally going to get to that XK a month that makes this my full-time job or makes this my long-term you know, occupation, right? And so getting a sense of that and, and really with the forecasting, the, the way it's done in Summit, the benefit is you can run that calculation and you can get a different number each time depending on the assumptions that you make. So if you assume that your close rate is, let's just say, you know, 25%, right? Maybe your break even date is seven months from now, but you probably don't have that level of confidence in your close rate. Like maybe you're, maybe what you want to say instead is like, I don't know, my close rate is probably going to be somewhere between, you know, 15 and 30%. Like, or you look at, 
you know, the independent SAS report that you just did, Rob, and you're like, at some point, it's like, what's the benchmark, right, for these numbers? Let me just assume a range, right? Well, what happens if your break even is, well, maybe it's seven, but maybe it's 12, right? Like just helping to get an understanding that the future is uncertain, right? It's, it's, we don't forecast to be precise and certain about things in some cases. We forecast to accept or maybe come to grips with the variability in some of these things, right? So like a five-month difference in break-even it could be huge, right? It's like, when do I actually want to quit my consulting gig? <laughs> or, you know, when do, I, when do I actually quit my job? Or how much emergency savings do I really need? So like, those are all those are all big decisions that you make, even if you're not fundraising, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. And, you know, I was thinking I could have used this with, with Drip. We would grow by 5K MRR. And then I would be like, okay, now I have enough money to hire a customer success person or whatever, you know, or a support person. And then we grow by 10K and I'd say, all right, now I have the, you know, the money to hire a developer. And it was always, once that had happened, then I would start the process and then it would take two to three months to hire that person. So if I had some kind of inkling, you know what I mean? And like you said, it's, it's not an exact prediction, but it's a, hey, in the next 30 to 60 days or whatever, you're going to be at this level where there's that much more profit. Yeah, that's 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 the use case definitely on the default default alive and maybe you know still living off of your revenues and not fundraising is, you know we we know that hiring takes time. Knowing that you're very likely to have the you know revenue that you need to support that person ahead of time, absolutely getting ahead of hiring is is strategic. And so you know as I think about prediction and forecasting, I have almost no exposure to it, you know, other than looking at the weather on my iPhone all the time because I live in Minneapolis. But but like how how accurate can you get with something like this? Because I, I know, I have to imagine there's some skepticism. You know, if, if you look at, let's just, I won't name a name, but just any random metrics provider and the revenue is kind of going up into the right gradually and then when, there's today and then it just keeps going up into the right at the same exact, it's just a linear, you know, extrapolation on what's going on. But I guess how is Summit different than that and how accurate can it actually be given the ran- you know the crazy randomness of startups, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think you're right. Like if you just take a trend line, which is what we've been talking about so far, I think that numbers don't really understand the business in, in the way that we do as entrepreneurs. And so we can look at that line and, and see it going up into the right. And we have a lot of intuition that that's not right, right? Like that's wrong for some reason. And, you know, is a straight line better than nothing? Like, Maybe, you know, a trend is probably better than nothing. But where it really gets interesting is when we use more than one method of coming to that conclusion. So folks can be scientific. I mean, if you're thinking about a scientific theory, for example, where you can start to have more confidence in something is when you make observations and they both confirm or or corroborate a theory that you have. So it's like, well, you know, we measured this thing we took the temperature and we also, you know, looked at the, the rock formations, right. Or whatever it is. So you take geology and, and meteorology, you take a bunch of different scientific disciplines and you look at all the evidence and you say, wow, you know, the evidence from all these different fields says that this probably happened. Right. And it's kind of like, we're used to that in other domains as scientists, but we don't think of it in terms of start. So what the heck does it have to do with starting up? Well, think about it this way. Statistics is one thing, like your revenue is growing at 5% month over month. Like, Therefore, this is what your revenue is going to be in in December, right? But you need another method to kind of check and balance that and say, that's what this method says, right? If you just use arithmetic and linear growth or compounding growth, you're here. What Summit also does is it brings in simulation. And simulation is really, it's different because it's it's not machine learning in the sense of like looking at a bunch of data and finding patterns and coming to a conclusion, right? It's simulating the life of your business. And so I, I always like to give this example, like revenue might go up into the right if you just do a statistical outlook, like 5% every month, man, you know, and, and you're going to be here by, by December. It's like, yay, that's great. But you know what the statistics don't know is that you don't have the cash to keep hiring salespeople or you don't have the cash on hand to keep spending on paid acquisition, right? Which is how you've been growing revenue so far. So the simulation is is very useful because it will look at your cash balance and you can almost think of it like reconciling these things of like revenue can't keep going up if we run out of money, right? And at some point our engineering team is going to be so busy with the current feature set, right? That they're not gonna be able to roll out features as fast. And like 
stuff just starts to change over time in a way that like a pure mathematical view doesn't understand. And so what the simulation does is it, it actually does run through those different kinds of, say, dependencies, right, of saying your sales is dependent on hiring salespeople. Your cash balance is not supporting you hiring another salesperson in three months. Therefore, right, you're not going to keep adding revenue, right? However, if you want to keep adding revenue, you should go hire a salesperson, right? And, and it'll give you a recommendation to go hire a salesperson, right? But like that to me is where it gets a lot more realistic because, and the evidence of that is if you run through a bunch of um, forecasts in Summit, it's actually hard to get the thing to draw a hockey stick, right? It's like you need a lot of things working really well to do that. Whereas if I left you, you know, again, alone with a spreadsheet, you could come out with a hockey stick in five minutes because it's just, it's just wish casting, right? Um, so back to the point, I think your confidence can go up the more different ways you have of forecasting and seeing those line up, right? So I've seen some startups where it's like, wow, the statistical trends are very consistent and high confidence level. And if you put all these assumptions in the simulation, you get a very similar result. Like that's a business that's kind of figured out its business model. And I think you can put a lot more confidence in that than somebody who's like, I'm not certain about my pricing. I'm not certain about my close rates. I'm not certain about et cetera, et cetera, right? Like that's where all this risk comes from in our forecasting is we we ourselves don't know, you know, what what tomorrow's gonna gonna hold. Right. And that makes sense. And the simulation, is it a, a Monte Carlo simulation? Is it that kind of thing? Yeah, it, it is a Monte Carlo simulation. Well, it's Monte Carlo method. So if, if we want to geek out for a second and I'll keep it high level, it's it's a simulation in in a way of stepping through time and making decisions, but the decisions that it makes does use Monte Carlo methods, which that is really a dice roll. I, I use the, I like to use the example of um, D and D players will, will love this, but anybody who plays games, you know, basically the simulator rolls dice many, many times every month to decide what, what happens next. And kind of the shape of those dice, if you will, depends on your business. And I'll just leave it at that. So it's, it, it's a bunch of randomness that gets inserted too. And the randomness is helpful because then the output is a range of possibilities, not just one possibility, right? And so, so you can see some cool stuff like, wow, there is a big spread <laughs> in terms of where we're going to be in 12 months, right? And like, how do we tighten that up so that we can be confident that when we hire this person, we're able to keep them hired <laughs> into the future? Yeah, the fun part is, you know, all the tiny seed portfolio companies are in um, using Summit. And I've talked to a few of them who say they, they go in and just, it's like a little toy. You're like, I'm going to change this assumption and see what happens. I'm going to change that assumption and see what happens. And it's like a fun, if you do like to to nerd out on your own SaaS metrics, which I will raise my hand and admit, right, I'll be the first one to to admit that I uh, would check revenue constantly, you know, and MRR growth and all that stuff when I was when I was back, back in the day. But it, it's something you can really geek out with. And I, I really, I like that you pointed out that trying to get a hockey stick is really hard. Like a ton of things have to come together because that's reality. You know, like that, that's why like so few businesses hockey stick. And when they do, it's cause this, it's this, it's like hard work and market timing and a little bit of luck and you did some things right. And you know, it's all this stuff has to come together for that to work. You know, you talk to any founder who's done it and they, you know, if they're, I believe if they're being honest with themselves, they, it's a lot of factors. It's never like, oh, I was really smart. It's always this, this, that, and this. And I happened to time right as this technology took off and SaaS was becoming a thing or the iPhone had just come out, or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It just goes on. So yeah, I think that's cool. Yeah. And, and, and I think that, you know, I think that the challenge I might have for folks is, you know, the thing you're working on right now, like the feature you're about to launch, the, you know, the marketing campaign you're doing, have you had the time or given yourself the time to really predict, I'll say, or decide what the impact is going to be to your business? Like you're working on that feature because you think it's going to improve retention. Let's, let's run with that for a second. How much, right? And maybe you don't know, maybe it's just a little bit, maybe it's a lot, right? Like, have you run the numbers against your business and said, if this works and it improves retention by X percent, where are we, right, 12 months from now compared to not maybe not doing it at all, right, or doing something different? My dreams, you know, scenario is when people get together to decide what they're going to work on next, like, imagine running a unit test, if you will, of your financials, or your business, and saying, wait, wait a minute, if we, if we work on this for a month, and it only improves retention by... 6%. Like that's not going to help us hit our annual revenue target, right? And like 
imagine deciding that that's not the right thing to work on right now because it just doesn't move the needle, right? Even if it goes exactly as you want to and customers receive it the way that you expect them to, like if it doesn't move the needle, like should you be working on it next? I don't think most of us have the luxury of doing that analysis, but I'd love to make that really easy for folks. Yeah, and as, as we wrap up, I want to call out one of the reports you have is, is a survivor curve. And it's kind of like the opposite of a churn, like a cohort churn grid. And if you're listening to this and you run a SaaS app and you've never seen a survivor curve for your app, I would really encourage you to check this out. So you go, it's usesummit.com and you have a free plan so people can log in and you just connect your Stripe analytics. And the survivor curve shows... I believe it's by cohort, like how long people stick around, how many people stick around after X months, right? So it's this long line. It's like after one month, you have this many left. After six months, this many left. And if that curve doesn't flatten out somewhere, you have a problem, right? Would you, would you agree with that sentiment? I mean, that's, that's something I would hand build these for drip until we could get the code to do it. It was, it was quite complicated actually. And I would sit there and stare at that thing and you know, you want it to, to flatten because it's going down in essence because you're, you know, it's how many users you're, you have remaining from that cohort. And you want it to be as shallow as possible, meaning it goes down just a little bit and then flattens. But most startups, it's not that. It just winds up being this gradual, gradual, gradual. And if it ends up going basically asymptotic to, well, that's a, that's a 25 cent word there. If it's, an as, if it's an asymptote to zero and it really never flattens out, then you can grow a decent sized business, but trying to get into many millions of dollars is going to be, a, you're going to have a really, really wide funnel at the top to get there. Yeah, that's, that's your foundation. I mean, the way I think of it is if, if that curve stretches out to zero or, you know, 2% sometimes it's like the, you know, maybe they stick around, um, you're building on quicksand, right? And you just trying to build that, that sandcastle, if you will, as the base is eroding is almost impossible. And so, you know, seeing something where, 30%, 40% of your customers stick around, I'll almost say, quote unquote, indefinitely. That is, you know, the foundation you need. And, and I agree, it, it actually is all of your customers from all your cohorts. So you can you can look at these in bare metrics or uh, Stripe, I know, and see like out of last month's signups, et cetera, how many stick around. But this is actually looking at in aggregate across all subscriptions for all time, how long does the average signup stick around? And uh, yeah, it's 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 foundational. Sounds good, sir. So thanks again for coming on the show. If folks want to hear you talk for about 45 minutes every week about what you're up to from the maker and manager side with our good friend, Peter Sum, they can head over to the Out of Beta podcast. And you are at Matt Wensing on Twitter, where you're pretty active and you have some, you have some good thoughts you're sharing on there. So I encourage folks, again, to check out all the stuff Matt is up to. Thanks so much. If you have a question for me, for Matt Wensing, really for any guests that we've had on, please, you can email questions at startupsfortherestofus.com, attach an audio file, it'll go to the top of the stack, or if you send in text, obviously I will read that as well. You can also leave us a voicemail at 888-801-9690. Subscribe to us by searching for startups and really any of the, the podcatchers. And you know, it's crazy, uh, in Spotify right now, I'm seeing new users being added constantly. I just, I don't listen to podcasts in Spotify, but they're obviously getting some traction. So pretty interesting. Um, if you're a podcaster and you're not already submitted to Spotify, it's something I'd recommend. Of course, visit startupsfortherestofus.com for full show notes, a full transcript of each episode, and to, uh, to lend us your thoughts. If you want to tweet me, I'm at Rob Walling. This podcast is at Startups Pod. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next week.